As we've already said, one of the major uh, roles of the plasma membrane is to regulate the passage of molecules into and out of the cell. Now, this is very important because of the cells need to maintain homeostasis and help maintain those normal operating conditions when undergoing environmental changes. So one of the cell's primary mechanisms of maintaining homeostasis is by having a semi-permeable membrane or selectively permeable membrane. All that means is that the semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane allows some some substances to move across the membrane while keeping other molecules out. Now, as I've kind of mentioned before, small and non-charged non-polar molecules can readily diffuse across the plasma membrane. Their size allows them to penetrate those polar heads and the non-polarity makes them similar to and have an affinity for the non-polar tails of the plasma membrane. These molecules can easily diffuse through the membrane and do so by following their concentration gradient. Now what I mean by a concentration gradient is that they're going to be moving from an area of high molecular concentration to an area of lower molecular concentration. A fantastic example of this would be respiration, cellular respiration. Uh, so for example, um, there's going to be a very low, because of the constant um, cellular respiration that's happening at the mitochondria, your mitochondria are constantly breaking down glucose to produce ATP. This, this process requires oxygen. It needs oxygen and it produces huge amounts of carbon dioxide. Because of this, there's very little free-floating oxygen inside of the cell membrane. So oxygen is going to flow from outside of the cell, where it's abundant, to inside of the cell, where it's not abundant, where it's scarce. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is constantly being produced by the mitochondria. So there's a huge concentration of carbon dioxide inside of the cell and a very low concentration of carbon dioxide outside of the cell. So carbon dioxide is always going to be diffusing across the plasma membrane from the inside to the outside of the cell. This movement is just called moving down the concentration gradient, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Here's an example of how molecules can uh, move across the plasma membrane. Like I said before, charged molecules are not going to be able to cut it. Um, water is also not going to be able to move across the plasma membrane. Charged molecules have an affinity for water. Water molecules have an affinity for water. That's where cohesion comes into play. Remember all the hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules? Water doesn't want to leave itself. Water loves water. So water is not going to pass through this nonpolar hydrophobic desert. These hydrophobic tails don't like water any more than water likes these nonpolar hydrophobic tails. Water is not going to pass through the plasma membrane, not without some help. So we're going to need a channel protein if we're going to get water from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Non-charged molecules can pass through. Um, anything that doesn't have a really large charge, um, Carbon dioxide, like we said, oxygen, both of those are going to be very small, very non-charged. They're going to have no problem moving across the plasma membrane. Macromolecules, even if they are nonpolar, are still going to be too big to squeeze in between these phosphate heads. Those are going to be turned away. They're not going to be able to pass through unless we have some other method for getting them through. So we're going to talk a little bit greater depth about diffusion. I know I just mentioned it very, very briefly. So we're going to have a whole section devoted to diffusion and that movement down a concentration gradient. So we're going to start off with passive transport across the membrane. Passive transport is going to be the movement of molecules across the cell membrane in such a way that does not require any energy. Basically, we're flowing downstream. You can kind of think of passive transport as a float trip. You get in your inner tube, you float down the river. You get in your canoe, you float down the river, raft, whatever. You're floating down the river. No energy is required if you're going with the flow, if you're moving um, down river. Diffusion is going to be simply the net movement of molecules down their concentration gradient or the movement from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this is going to continue until an equilibrium is reached and the molecules are evenly distributed. So diffusion, um, you may be familiar with this term, but just to bring some more clarity, um, diffusion would be like when, uh, if you've ever seen those scent sprayers, um, like those Febreze sprayers, if you walk by, um, they'll spray a little mist of scent into the air. 
What we find is that when the mist is first sprayed, there's a really high concentration of scent molecules right around the mister. There's a very low concentration of scent molecules in the rest of the room. So the whole rest of the room stinks while we have that air freshener sitting over there in the corner. However, given enough time, those scent molecules will diffuse. They'll slowly move from an area of high concentration in the corner to areas of low concentration in the rest of the room. And they will continue to move until we reach equilibrium. And equilibrium is not when all of the scent molecules from the right side of the room have gone over to the left side of the room. But equilibrium is when we have an even distribution, when net movement stops, when we stop seeing a flow from right to left, but instead we just sort of see an even mixing all throughout. So it's when the solute concentration is uniform, there's no gradient. Or you may have also seen or noticed if you've ever poured creamer into hot coffee. When you first pour it in, there's going to be like a little glob of cream right down the center of your coffee and it'll all kind of sink to the bottom. Equilibrium is when you stir your coffee up and we have an even concentration of cream molecules and coffee molecules all throughout the whole cup of coffee. Now that doesn't mean that the molecules on the top aren't flowing down to the bottom or that the cream molecules are only you know concentrated now at the top of the coffee cup and not at the bottom anymore. It just means that we now have completely even equal movement everywhere. There's no gradient. There's no area of cream in an area of coffee. We just have a completely even mix of cream and coffee everywhere. So equilibrium is when net movement stops. And there are a lot of things that can affect equilibrium. Um, things like temperature, pressure, electrical currents, molecular size, all of these things are going to affect that rate of diffusion and affect the rate at which we reach equilibrium. Here we have a diagram shown from your textbook that kind of walks through that process of diffusion. What we have is an, a little crystal of dye in one corner. Right here we have a very high concentration of crystal molecules and a very low concentration of water molecules. Over here we have a high concentration of water molecules and a very low or no concentration of dye molecules. Given a little bit of time, we're going to see that the dye molecules are going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And the water molecules are going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this is going to keep going until those molecules are completely evenly dispersed throughout. So we have just as much dye and water over here as we have dye and water over here. We have a completely even mix. Um, given enough time, this is the rate, or this is the direction that diffusion is going to go. So there are a couple of uh, different things that we want to talk about with the passive transport across the plasma membrane. Osmosis is a specific form of diffusion. Uh, osmosis is going to be, or the study of osmosis focuses primarily on the movement of the solvent, typically water rather than the solute. So in the example before, we would talk about how um, through diffusion, the dye crystals move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But when we talk about water molecules or the solvent, we call that osmosis. We would say through osmosis, the water moved from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So diffusion is just the movement of molecules down the concentration gradient. Usually it refers to the, the solute. Uh, osmosis, on the other hand, refers to the solvent. So that would be water in this case, or in most cases. Really, in this class, we're only ever going to talk about osmosis as the movement of water. Um, but the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane is what we call osmosis. Um, Semi-permeable membranes allow some but not all molecules to flow freely across. So in this case, the semi-permeability semi refers to the ability of the water to move, but not the solute. So on one side of the membrane, the solute concentration is high and water concentration is low. On the other side of the membrane, the solute concentration is low, but the water concentration is high. Water can move both ways across the membrane, but the solute cannot. And so we're going to see that water is going to move towards, net movement of water is going to be towards the low water, high solute concentration. And we're going to um, call this movement or refer to it as osmotic pressure. It's the pressure that develops due to osmosis. And here, I know that's a lot of terminology thrown at you, but <clears throat> here's a diagram to kind of talk about that. 
So here's our demonstration of osmosis. In this tube containing a 10% solution um, covered on one end by a selectively permeable membrane. Uh, is going to be placed in a beaker with a 5% water solution. Now this means that there is a higher solute concentration on the outside than uh, or on the inside than on the outside. So there's more water here, less water here. More dye here, less dye here. Now here's the interesting thing. Dye molecules cannot move across the selectively permeable membrane. Water molecules can go across. Dye molecules cannot. So what's going to happen is that water is going to rush in across that plasma or across that semi-permeable membrane, but the dye molecules are going to stay still. Now the water is going to rush across because it wants to have an equal concentration on both sides of that plasma membrane. So we're going to see a movement until we have the relatively same concentration. And we can get the same concentration by the water leaving the outside and going inside. And you can see that by this uh, dye becoming more dilute, it lightens up as water rushes in across that thistle tube and we're going to see that volume increase. And the, um, the increase in the thistle tube and decrease in the beaker. And this is because we want to have the exact same concentration on the inside of the tube as we have on the outside. Since the dye molecules can't go across the plasma membrane, water is going to have to rush across. Water is going to have to be the great equalizer here and to try and get both um, solutions to the same concentration. Now the reason we care about this is because it greatly affects um, or determine cellular behavior when we put it in a particular solution. There are several different types of solutions that can direct the flow and the direction of osmotic pressure. We're going to start off by talking about an isotonic solution. And in a laboratory, the cells are going to typically be placed in isotonic solutions. If we want to keep our cells healthy and happy, we need to make sure that we have the same concentration of, of stuff inside the cell as we have outside of the cell. Um, the, this is what we call an isotonic solution. Iso meaning same as, tonicity referring to strength. And an isotonic solution, the, the solute concentration and the water concentration both inside and outside of the cell is completely equal. So there's going to be no net gain of water, no loss of water. Just as much water is flowing in as is flowing back out. For every one arrow in, we've got one arrow out. Now the solute concentration of red blood cells is going to be roughly 0.9%. So, um, or just throwing this out there as a, as a question for all of you, if we have an individual who comes into the hospital and they're dehydrated, do we give them, if we give them an IV, um, do we inject pure water into their veins? Why or why not would you inject pure water into their veins? I'll tell you why not. It's because our cells are not made out of pure water. Um, we need to make sure that an IV solution, typically what we call a saline solution, saline just means that it contains salts and solutes, has the exact same concentration as the cells in our body. Um, we want to make sure that we are using an isotonic solution to keep our cells healthy and happy. If we were to inject pure water into our veins, we would have a solution that is hypotonic, meaning that the concentration of solute in the solution is lower than the inside of the cell. In other words, there's more salt, there's more stuff inside the cell than there is outside of the cell. So um, solutions that have a lower concentration of the cell are cell said to be hypotonic. Hypo meaning less than and tonicity again referring to the strength of the solution. If a cell is placed into a hypotonic solution this is going to cause the cell to swell because all the water is going to be rushing in. More water is coming in than is flowing back out. Unfortunately this can cause your cells to actually swell up so much that they burst like a balloon. So if the water, the lower water concentration then causes the, swell, the water to rush into the cell, any solution with a salt concentration lower than 0.9% is hypotonic to red blood cells. Animal cells placed in hypotonic solution will swell and may even burst. This is called cytolysis. Um, cyte meaning cell, also the root for the word cytoplasm, and lysis, to burst. Um, in red blood cells, this is specified as hemolysis. Heme, again referring to the red blood cells, and lysis to split apart. <laughs> 
Plant cells placed into a hypotonic cell will also swell. However, due to the presence of that cell wall that they have, the cell is not going to burst. Instead, it creates what we call turgor pressure. This is going to be important to maintain posture and structure of a plant. So it is very important. If you do want to keep your plants tall and healthy, do feed them lots and lots of fresh water um, to help maintain that turgor pressure.